bleeding purple and gold from the heart of Los Angeles. This is the LakersNation.com podcast with your host, Trevor Lane. Welcome to the Lakers Nation podcast. The Lakers right now are sitting at a two and four record. So we've got a lot to talk about today, a lot to break down in terms of the roster and lineup that Coach Luke Walton has been using. As always, today's show is powered by LakersNation.com and CLNS Media. And today's show is brought to you by MeUndies. Go to MeUndies.com slash LakersNation for 20% off the most comfortable underwear you will ever own. And NatureBox. Go to naturebox.com slash Lakers for 50% off some delicious snacks. Now, to help me break down everything that's gone on in the Lakers world over the first two weeks of NBA play, I brought in Lakers Nation senior writer Harrison Fagan. Harrison, thanks so much for hopping on. Thank you for having me. It's a, I, I like this dynamic a lot better than having you on Locked on Lakers because it means you have to do all the work and I just have to talk. So it's kind of nice. That's right. You get the, the easy job. I get the, the tough job. But then again, I, I kind of make you do all the talking on here anyway. So uh, so I think it kind of evens out a little bit. Yeah, I guess that's fair. We'll, we'll see how it goes and then we'll evaluate after the show. That sounds like a plan. So <laughs> as of as of right now, this this Lakers team is is kind of up and down. I mean, people were pretty excited about them heading into the season. But as of right now, they have dropped a few games that they definitely could have and maybe should have won most recently against the Toronto Raptors and the Utah Jazz. They're, they're losing games that it, it seems like they're kind of in the driver's seat or at least they're putting themselves in position to potentially win and then fading down the stretch. Is that just the mark of a young team or are changes needing to be made here? I'd argue it's more the mark of a young team and just a young team, because it kind of is it has become trite just to call them young and chalk every single error up to that. And I think that we should specify sometimes what we mean by what we're talking about when they're young. And I think young players are obviously they're good players. They wouldn't be in the NBA if they weren't good players. And I think the reason we're seeing them have more success in the second half or in the first half of games and then less in the second half is the NBA teams don't scout that extensively going into regular season games. So I think that in the, they come into these second halves and the teams have kind of learned they're like, okay, we need to get back in transition. They're not that effective outside of that. We know what we need to take away from Lonzo Ball. We know what we need to take away from Brandon Ingram. And these guys don't have that like second gear to get to yet where they can change their game and adapt to the way that they're being covered. And so when their first kind of option, their first way to play gets taken away or messed with, they don't necessarily know how to respond yet. And I think that that's why you're seeing them kind of blow these leads late as much as anything. Yeah. And also they just they, they just aren't hitting shots. And so when you aren't hitting shots and then teams start to get you out of transition and, you know, your three point shooting is pretty horrible, then you're just going to struggle. You're going to you're going to blow games late because you're just going to clank. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Right now, the Lakers are sitting at 29th in the NBA in three-point percentage. They're only converting 27.8% of their three-point attempts. And, I mean, if you look at the way this team is constructed around Lonzo Ball, they really need to be able to hit their threes in order to effectively space the floor. Now, it is only six games as of this recording that the team has played. So is this an indication of a larger problem, or is this just a small sample size thing and we should expect the team to improve going forward? I think the team will improve a little bit. I don't know how much it will make because they they obviously like they aren't going to shoot that badly the whole year. You would not think. But because that's that's just horrible. But I don't know how much that they're going to be a good three point shooting team. And I think that that's kind of and they aren't an especially willing three point shooting team. And so I think those two things have been as big of a problem as anything. Like I wrote about this a little bit today for Lakers Nation, actually. And, you know, you can shoot twenty seven point eight percent and kind of get away with it if you're like people are going to say oh well they're mitigating it by only taking like the fifth most threes in the league they're taking 24 threes a game but you're almost hurting yourself just as much by not taking them because then teams start to clog the paint even more they realize that you aren't even going to fire so why would they cover you and then you're taking away even more avenues in kind of the paint if you just aren't even presenting like the the myth of a threat from the outside because nobody's willing to shoot and the Lakers also they just don't have good three point shooters out of their high volume three point shooters last year the guys who took over a hundred the their three best in terms of percentage are all gone uh, D'Angelo Russell Lou Williams and Nick Young and it, it's been talked to, the whole D'Angelo Russell trade has been talked to death we don't need to relitigate that here again but I think that 
one kind of understated factor of it was that it did remove one of the Lakers' best three-point shooters. And Brooke Lopez, you know, the Lakers, they wanted to talk about all summer. He's the only big in the league that made 134 three or whatever stat they were throwing out about him hitting 134 threes and how impressive that was for a seven-footer. He has not hit 134 threes yet. He has not hit very many threes yet. And they just don't have a lot of spacing on the floor other than hit. They just don't have guys that are three-point shooters. It's it's like, who's the best three-point shooter on the Lakers roster? Yeah, I mean, that was really, that was supposed to be Brooke Lopez. I mean, last season he was a 35% three-point shooter, which is pretty much echoing what D'Angelo Russell did. So the thought was that Russell's three-point shooting was, it was it's a bit odd to think of it this way, but was going to be replaced by the team's starting center, that Lopez was going to be able to step out and be that threat from deep. Instead, this season, he is only shooting 25%, which is a very, very big difference. And if that continues, teams will leave him alone when he's outside because that's kind of the, the breaking point where it makes more sense just to let him fire away if he's only going to make 20% from three. So... Heading into the season, we thought that Brooke Lopez was the perfect fit alongside a guy like Julius Randle in the starting five because he would be able to space the floor, which Randle didn't do a great job of, and he would protect the paint. And we're not really seeing that either. I mean, Brooke Lopez is only getting 0.8 blocks right now. Am I reading that right? Oh, no, wait. He's got got 1.3 blocks, which is still low, though, for him. He was a 1.7, and it seems like he's challenging at the rim a decent amount, but he's not quite blocking all that many shots he's getting dragged out quite a bit while not really dragging out the opposing big on the other side because he's not hitting from three is this just him getting used to this new Lakers lineup or I mean what what do you expect to see from Brooke Lopez here going forward I, I mean, to me, Brooke Lopez, he, he's been okay defensively. I don't think, like, the problem is that if you're counting on Brooke Lopez to fix your defense, like, that's your problem. But the Lakers have actually been pretty good defensively. Like, it's weird uh, that defense hasn't been the problem for once. It's actually been offense when this team was marketed as they're going to be so young and fun and they're going to mess up defensively, but at least their offense is going to be fun to watch. And it's actually been the opposite. They've been winning games with their defense, which is why I think there is reason to worry about their offense, or about, about them. Them because I don't think that the Lakers, where are they at in defensive efficiency right now? I think that, I think they're like 11th or something. They're 12th and right now in defense in defensive rating, which is which is incredible. I mean, I they were 20, what they were 30th last season. So yeah, they were, they were the like, worst. Are they going to be 12th? Are they going to be 12th the whole season? Like, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that that's particularly realistic to hope for. Are they going to be out of the bottom 20 for the whole season? I kind of doubt it. I mean, everybody's going to get mad at me for saying that, but I, I don't think that the, I don't think that they're going to stay out of the bottom 20 the entire season as hard as they're trying and as hard like as much progress as they've clearly made. They just don't have the personnel for that. And so when the defense drops off. The, if and the, if the offense doesn't take a jump, and I don't know that it will, because they just don't seem to have the three-point shooting on this roster to have success in in the NBA in 2017. I I don't know. I, I wrote this yesterday, but they might be looking back on this two and six stretch fondly, as sad as that sounds, because it just or two sorry two and four stretch. Um, it, it just like it it looks bad right now. Th- things look bad. And I, I mean, Lonzo will probably get, start to shoot a little bit better. I think there's reason for optimism there. Maybe Brandon Ingram starts to step up. But like at that point, you're counting on two of your youngest players to bring you back towards offensive competence, not not only with the big creation role that they have, but in terms of spacing. And that's kind of a fundamental problem constru- roster construction wise. Well, yeah, I want, to, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the roster, and I want to talk about where the Lakers are sitting right now in terms of offensive rating and kind of what can be done to, to fix that. But first, got to take just a very, very quick pause and talk about MeUndies, one of our, our wonderful sponsors. MeUndies is a fantastic company. They make feel-good underwear that you'll be proud to wear, the most pump, uh, comfortable underwear you will ever own. I'm wearing some right now. They, they are absolutely wonderful. Go to MeUndies.com slash. Lakers Nation, you get 20% off the best, softest underwear you will ever own. They they have tons of styles and patterns to choose from for both men and ladies, and they have the perfect fit for any personality. They have all kinds of different choices you can make stylistically and pick whatever colors or anything that, that you like. And the feeling is unmatched because they have a naturally soft fabric that is actually three times softer than cotton. And when you feel these things, you really notice it. It is a major, major difference. And for a limited time, they actually have gl- a glow-in-the-dark print 
segment called Lights Out, which is is pretty awesome. I love them. And so if underwear though is not your thing, you can actually get socks from them as well. So they have they have super soft socks. So a lot of different options at MeUndies. Would highly recommend that you guys check them out. They're a product that I use uh, myself, and they are absolutely wonderful. Again, get 20% off the best, softest underwear you will ever own. 100% satisfaction guarantee. Go to MeUndies.com slash LakersNation. Again, that's MeUndies.com slash LakersNation. So, Harrison, you mentioned the Lakers offense, and it is absolutely struggling. They are right now 29th in the NBA in terms of offensive rating. And, of course, there's only six games on the books so it's a very very small sample size but still there's some real concern here and one of the things that i'm seeing people start to harp on is lonzo ball and his shooting that's starting to become an area of concern and i tend to fall more on the conservative side here i think it's so early that maybe we shouldn't be too worried about it but this is what he's doing right now he's shooting 31 percent from the field overall and just 28 percent from three which certainly fits right in line with the lakers struggles overall as a team from downtown harrison what are you seeing from lonzo ball that suggests that improvements may be coming in this area i just i, I think the main thing that would suggest that improvements would be coming and that he's not a big ball or bust are that he's just like he shot so well from three his whole career so if you're hoping that he's going to turn it around i think that's kind of the thing that you're going to point to is that he, he's been a good three-point shooter and he's done it he, he wasn't just doing it at the college line like these were threes that he was taking from nba distance at times and It doesn't to me, the problem doesn't seem to be that like the length is too much for him, because that was, I think, something that people were worried about because of the where his shot kind of releases that maybe he couldn't get it past NBA length. But he releases it quickly. He's taking open. He's missing open ones. And so I think right now this is just a matter of regression to the mean but in a good way like regressing upward just getting back kind of towards the normal Uh, and so i'm not honestly i'm not worried about lonzo ball shot at all i I think it is going to come around i just i just doubt that that's enough to totally fix the lakers defense lakers offense no no that in and of itself isn't enough but for lonzo ball for his own personal potential for his own upside we're gonna have to see those numbers improve of course he is six games into his rookie season i mean it takes a little while to get addressed adjusted to reading the defense and understanding when to shoot when not to when to drive all that kind of stuff i feel like he has no problem confidence wise with taking those big shots it seems like he really he really doesn't get rattled so i've got a lot of faith that that number is going to move up as he gets a more experience as an NBA player going against starting level guards. I mean, we know that that's a whole new level of defense that he hasn't faced before. So I think that is going to improve. Of course, the hope for the Lakers is that his improvement will coincide with the improvement of some other guys from outside. And that's where I want to talk about this starting lineup that Luke Walton has put along with Lonzo Ball. So he's got Lonzo, KCP, and Brandon Ingram at the 1, 2, and 3, which is is pretty standard. That's what everybody expected coming in. But then you have Larry Nance Jr. in the 4 spot, and that was not anticipated, along with Brooke Lopez at the 5, which everybody expected. So really the question mark here is Larry Nance Jr. at that 4 spot, and I've been seeing a lot of people, especially on Twitter, that have been ranting and raving about how someone else should be starting at that spot in order to truly optimize Lonzo's skills and get the best out of that starting unit, which has been struggling. So, Harrison, where do you stand on that argument? Do you think Luke should stick with Larry Nance Jr. there, or should changes be made at this stage? It's been kind of amazing to see how quickly Lakers fans have turned on Larry Nance Jr., he went from basically like fan favorite all of last season for most of his career to like everybody is just crapping on him on Twitter now. And I think it's because of the starting lineup thing. It's clear that he's not really a fit. He's actually not playing terribly. He He's played fine in a lot of these games, but he just it, it, it's a matter of. If you're putting out a lineup out there because you think it best optimizes Larry Nance Jr., then that's kind of a problem. And I don't I'm not suggesting that that's why Luke is doing it. But I think it's more of like a he he fits better with this lineup than he does with the bench type thing. And I just don't know that that's really like a good argument to have him out there. I don't know that he's I think the Lakers lineup right now is helping Larry Nance more than he's helping the Lakers lineup, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree and, with that. The guy that I think should be out there is still Kuzma. Like, I know he's a rookie, and I know that that's a lot to ask of an almost second-round rookie. 
but he's been so good so far and his three point shooting would cl- so clearly help that group. And as long as you're not doing like five man hockey subs and you stagger rotations, then you should still be able to keep at least as much spacing on the floor as the Lakers have had so far with that bench unit. And I, like, I, I know the bench has been good, but it's just coming back and you're hitting this wall again, like last year of like, Oh, the bench lineup's really good. We don't want to break them up. So we're going to start this clearly inferior player and like tank our entire like first five minutes. And I, I just don't think that that's a convincing argument anymore. I think we've seen how this goes. And I think I, I would argue for Kuzma to be out there. Although uh, there is, uh, there's also an argument for Randall. He's also played really, really well. Although, I, I would still I would say Kuzma if I had to pick one right now. Yeah, they are. There are some intriguing options there that are not Larry Nance Jr. And that's I think that that something that's happening and you kind of touched upon this is that fans are are sort of bashing Nance for things that maybe aren't really his fault. I mean, he's he's playing within himself and he's doing Larry Nance Jr. things. I mean, he is crashing the boards. He is getting tip-in dunks and things like that, getting his offense on just simple cuts to the basket. He's not really shooting much from outside. He's playing tough defense and doing all that. I mean, he's doing things that you would expect Larry Nance Jr. to do. But it just doesn't seem like it's a great fit with that starting lineup. And part of that is because he's so unwilling to shoot, especially from outside, that he has like he has zero gravity. I mean, he's not drawing anybody to him because they know he's not going to shoot. And then teams, I noticed this especially against the Toronto Raptors, teams are totally willing to switch a guard onto him. So if he goes and sets a screen, they have no problem whatsoever with, say, Kyle Lowry dropping onto Larry Nance Jr. and then Nance posting him up because Nance doesn't really have post moves. So they're not going to get burned there. And I just Well, it's not even just that he doesn't have post moves, but it's like if the Lakers are posting up Larry Nance, then you kind of won that possession. Right. Like that's, you know, that, that's not the most threatening option that any NBA team should be able to get at, at any point. Right. That's that's just not his his game. So yeah. I think that they do need some other kind of weapon because by having Nance out there, a guy who is offensively allergic basically i mean he, he doesn't really focus on his offense at all that's just not his game and that's okay that's still a very useful player but when you have him out there it sort of it nerfs the offense in a way it just makes it, it makes it weaker because you don't have that piece there that can create something and so you're putting a lot of pressure onto brandon ingram to create something for himself you're putting pressure onto kcp onto lonzo ball to kind of make things happen and create shots for others and maybe that's not something you should really be doing with them a guy like kuzma would at least keep the spacing in the floor on the floor and he's a guy who can when he gets into the paint he can make the right read and pass the ball out and I think Randall has been playing really, really well too. But that's another topic I wanted I wanted to touch upon. I agree with you as far as Kuzma moving into the starting lineup. I would be in favor of that. Even though he's a rookie, I know that would be a lot to ask of him to take on starting level power forwards in the NBA. But I think at this point, he's shown that he's been ready for everything that the Lakers have thrown at him so far. So why not give him this extra challenge? And in addition to that, I think, and I'll get your take on it here, Julius Randle has shown a lot as a backup center. I've been really impressed with his play at the backup five, backing up Brooke Lopez in that second unit. I'd like to see him stick in that role. What have you seen from Julius Randle, and do you agree that he's suddenly growing into this backup center role? Uh, Yeah, so, you know, I hate to say Byron Scott was right, but (laughs) I think— I think he he may have had a point on this one with like at least in like his treatment of Randall and maybe Randall's like game wasn't ready for it yet. But it seems like either intentionally or not, Luke Walton kind of pissed off Julius Randall and it kind of worked. And so like he, we saw the first couple games, he was he, he was singling out Randall more than anyone. He was screaming at him on the sidelines. He was right. calling him out in the media. And for whatever reason, it worked. And so I, like Randall seems I'm like, I don't know if like those two are still like great or whatever. Like I don't have the sourcing to like tell you that, but it's led to really great play from Randall. And I, that's why I would keep him with the bench, because I think that you have him in this role that he's kind of perfect for. He's getting to use a lot more of the offense there. His lack of shooting is mitigated by the fact that he's playing with these smaller kind of more aggressive quicker lineups and he's done a good job defending centers for the most part like he was going at the Marcus Cousins in that game when they were playing against the Pelicans and holding his own 
Yeah, exactly. And it, like it's playing against he needs to play against Kentucky guys every single game right. to get the uh, like the optimal out of Julius Randle. But he, he played really well against Cousins. He's held his own against centers and he's done pretty good as a rim protector. Like he that was the problem with playing him as the backup center the last two years uh, was that he just couldn't really get by at the, defending the rim. The Lakers were just like hemorrhaging points there. And he's done a pretty good job on switches. And so I, I like him as the fulcrum of that bench unit. And I think that more so than even just this year, if the Lakers are thinking about potentially keeping him, then that's the role he might be best in going forward in the modern NBA. And so you almost want him to stick there because it's it's better preparation for what he's going to continue to be doing, probably. Oh, agreed. I mean, this is this is something that has been sort of heaped on Randall's shoulders for some time now. People have been comparing him for a while to Draymond Green and asking him to do Draymond Green things. And that's that's a really tough thing for a guy like Randall to have to live up to. But I think we have been seeing more Draymond-esque play, especially on the defensive end. And I'm looking at his, at his stats right now. Randall has never been a very big shot blocker. Last season, he blocked half a shot per game, 0.5 shots per game. He's never been much of a rim protector, but now in the phenomenal physical shape that he is in, it seems like he is getting more lift and he's challenging at the rim more often. And he is now up to 1.2 blocks per game. And that's indicative of how much more effort he is getting to really be a presence there in the paint. So I've been really impressed with Randall at that backup five position. I wouldn't be comfortable just yet with throwing him in to the starting mix. I wouldn't look at him and say, oh, Julius Randall is the Lakers starting center going forward. Should they lose Brooke Lopez or anything like that? But I think this being that five off the bench for the Lakers is a perfect role. And then allowing him to stay on the floor and finish games when he really has it going is critical too. And we've seen him make big plays like down the stretch against the Washington Wizards. He had some phenomenal plays to help the Lakers get the win there. So overall, the season started off really rocky for Randall. But in these last few games, especially this week, he's really turned it on. And I think we're starting to see kind of if you squint what Julius Randall can be in this league. And so far, it's it's looking very good. I've been very impressed with him, but I agree with you. I'd say keep him in this bench role for right now. Maybe keep him angry. I mean, you mentioned that, that Luke kind of kind of took him <laughs> off, and, and it, maybe that's it's like the Incredible Hulk, the original Hulk, where you had to get him mad in order for him to to Hulk out. So I don't know. Maybe they just need to like hurl a few insults at Randall before every game or something like that, and then and then he'll be fired up to play. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think we need what we need to do really if 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 we're looking to help the Lakers here is we need to come up with the best strategies to piss off Julius Randle. And, you know, like maybe maybe you guys should start tweeting mean things. No, don't actually tweet mean things at him. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do that. Um, but, yeah, like maybe Luke should be de- and maybe he is. Maybe he has like a how to troll Julius Randall file somewhere in his office. And he has like a couple things. He's been calling Byron Scott for advice. And, you know, may- but in all seriousness, I think that we we kind of touched on that. Like if Randall is going to be a part of a really good team, this is going to be the role for him. It's going to be as the six man type big man off the bench, the first big off the bench and I just I think that it's too hard to fit a starting unit around him it, it kind of goes back to the Larry thing like we were talking about like if you're optimizing Larry Nance then you kind of just have messed up like he's not a good enough player that you want to just fit your whole team around him he needs to fit into whatever lineup you're doing and I think the same goes for Randall on kind of a different level whereas if you want to get a starting lineup around Randall where he's the four you have to have so much shooting in that lineup and kind of so stretch yourself and like warp your team build to best optimize him that I just don't know if it's worth it for a player of his caliber. But coming off the bench, he's going to be able to have a little bit more success against reserves. He's going to be able to have the ball in his hands a little bit more. So the lack of the shooting can come the shooting can come from other players other than him. So his lack of shooting is mitigated. And I think this is just going to be what he is going forward. If he's going to have a successful NBA career, it's going to be in this type of role. And so the Lakers should probably keep him there would be my argument. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Now, let's move on for a second here. Let's um, We're going to talk a bit more about the rotations that Luke Walton has been using. That's certainly been a major topic of conversation online. But first, I need to talk about NatureBox real quick here. A great company, NatureBox, sends you great snacks, just 
very, very tasty snacks directly to your door. You don't even have to have to go out to the store to get them. And we all want to eat better, but when it comes to snacks, sometimes it feels like the whole world is delicious and a billion calories or boring and tasteless. And I've certainly found that to be true. But with NatureBox, it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually up your snack game with NatureBox, which comes right to your door. They have over 100 snacks that taste good and are better for you. They're all very high quality, simple ingredients. No artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners. You can actually feel good about what you're eating. My favorite are the mini snickerdoodle cookies. They are absolutely phenomenal. My wife loves the dark cocoa nom noms because she loves chocolate, and so that's her her favorite thing. But they have something for everyone. You're gonna find your new snack obsession when you go to Nature Box. They add new snacks every month. They listen to your feedback and the latest food trends and professional chefs. They take all that, they put it together, and they decide what they're going to put out there next. It's really, really simple. You just go to naturebox.com slash Lakers. You choose the snacks you want, and NatureBox delivers them right to your door. And right now, you'll save even more because when you do go to naturebox.com slash Lakers, you get 50% off your first order up to $15 in value. So naturebox.com slash Lakers, you get 50% off your first order. Definitely go check them out, naturebox.com slash Lakers. All right, Harrison. So one of the things that I've been noticing that I did not see last season is a pushback against Luke Walton. More and more fans getting frustrated with Luke Walton's coaching and the rotations that he's using, especially the hockey style line changes where you have five players acting as the second unit, five players acting as the first unit, and very little mix and match. What needs to happen here in order to fix things? Are part of the Lakers troubles because of Luke Walton's rotations or... Or are fans just crazy and, and Luke's doing just fine with the hockey style line changes? Well, fans are crazy, but that I mean that's why we that's why they're called <laughs> that's fans. fans. But I, I don't think that they're to, and you know hey like I, I appreciate every like it's short for fanatic, but I mean that's why we have jobs and that's why like that's why I'm in the sports and that's why you're in the sports. Absolutely, and like like fans. being yeah being a fan is awesome, but sometimes you just like you don't necessarily. Uh, like think everything, but I, I think that there are legitimate criticisms of Luke's coaching. I, I think the hockey style line thing, it was cute and it worked to start last year. And I get why he's doing it from a locker room dynamic. It hel- it makes everybody feel like they're a part of the team or it makes more players feel like they're a part of the team. And it just kind of builds camaraderie and you get continuity in these units. But I just think that they're going to have to stagger more than they are. And he's done, I think, a little bit better job of it the last couple of games. He He's kind of made, like, Clarkson mostly the backup point guard, although Ennis got a, a few minutes the last, like, few nights. And I, I just... Like, I, I don't think it's crazy to criticize Luke Walton. I also I think it is crazy to start calling for his job or say that the Lakers need to make a change. Yeah, because I've seen like, that. Yeah, like he he's a new coach. He's going to like he has to make improvements too. It's not just a young team. It's a young coach in his first time with a team like this. Like his first run was as interim coach of the Golden State Warriors, which are a much easier team to coach and because they're just very very good. And he's going to have to adjust to this Lakers roster in this type of situation. He's only had a year. I think we've seen improvements. We've seen like I like I said they they started to go away from the hockey style lineup to line changes the last couple games. And so I think you're seeing progress and I just, I think you got to give him time too, because some of this is not just on him. It's also on having a young team. And so I haven't seen enough kind of egregious errors to start writing fire Luke Walton columns just yet. I think, I think there are reasons for concern certainly, but I don't think that he's perfect. I don't, I, cause the first year, all he really had to do was be not Byron Scott. And yeah. this year he actually has to be a good coach. And th- like, that's why I think we're seeing a lot more of that pressure from fans and a lot more of that upset, uh, like kind of nature from fans, because the first thing that everyone always wants to do as soon as the team starts going wrong is blame the coach because it's easier to get them out of there. They're kind of le- like people are less attached to coaches in general. And so generally they're the first scapegoat for this kind of stuff. And, I feel like I sound like people that I kind of made fun of when they were like uh, caping for Byron Scott a couple of years ago. But honestly, I think Luke deserves I, I think Luke deserves more time. Yeah, I mean, he is he is very new to this role and he already has some some great qualities that allow him to bring teams together. 
So you have to give him time just like you have to give the players time. Everybody was preaching patience. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people were preaching patience for D'Angelo Russell and were were panicking when he was traded and angry when he was traded. And people have been preaching patience for Brandon Ingram and patience for, for Alonzo Ball and everything. Well, Luke Walton is kind of in the, the same role. I mean, he is very, very new to this, and you have to give him time to figure things out. I do agree that the, the whole hockey lineup thing, that needs to change. And when I'm looking at it, if you're going to mix and match lineups, that means somebody's going to lose minutes. And so, Harrison, if you were looking at who the Lakers should take minutes away from, particularly from that perhaps that bench unit, who do you think should see their, their minutes chopped down in order to allow for a little bit more mixing and matching with the starters in the second unit? You know, I, I think Corey Brewer has been okay, and he, he's, like, helped while he's out there. But I, and, and I get why he's out there. I get the veteran thing. I get the, like, wanting to have, like, a heady presence who hustles and shows these guys good habits and stuff on the floor. I think there are arguments for his merit as far as inclusion in the rotation. But I just... I'd rather see Josh Hart continue to get minutes, and not that he's not getting minutes, but maybe get him some more minutes at the expense of Brewer and that type of thing. I, I think if I was going to pick one guy in the top kind of 10 in minutes played, then I'd pick Brewer, I'd say, to kind of be out. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Brewer is, you know, he, Brewer was great against the Phoenix Suns. He did a fantastic job um, guarding Devin Booker. I was really impressed with him there. But since then, I mean, he he doesn't offer much in the way of floor spacing. And I think that you're right. Everything that he does offer, you're getting out of Josh Hart and getting those minutes to Josh Hart and getting his his potential or getting him to reach his potential is uh, is a little bit more important for the Lakers right now. So, yeah, I would I would steal some minutes away from Brewer, especially if it, if it meant more playing time for Josh Hart, who has been phenomenal so far. He's been getting better each and every game, and I love the defensive intensity that he brings. I think that you'll have a little bit more cohesiveness if you keep a, a little bit of a shorter rotation. I mean, we're seeing Luke play 11 or 12 guys pretty much every night. I would chop that down to probably nine nine guys. I would probably remove. If you're going to use Clarkson as your backup point guard, then I, I would just take take Ennis out of the rotation. And then same thing with, with Brewer. And that's not to say Brewer's a terrible guy or, or terrible player. He does have his usefulness. No, I think I – think like to to be fair to him, he he was ready when he was called yeah. upon, and he deserves credit for that. And he deserves credit for doing things like picking up Lonzo Ball in practice, full court, so that he gets like a more difficult person to go against, and all, all the kind of little. Th- he's been like a steady veteran presence. He said all the right things. He's done all the right things. He's a good professional to have around the team, and he does. I, like I'm not, I want to make it clear that I'm not calling for his head because like I don't like him or I just think he's a bad player or whatever. He just. You know, he, he's less useful for the Lakers future plans than these other guys. And I think Hart has shown a lot of, you know, uh, pardon the pun, but uh, like of that same level of heart and that same level of hustle and things like that. And so just get him out there and continue to see what he is rather than continue to play Brewer. Yeah, agreed. I'd be I'd be right there with that. Now, one other thing that I've been seeing out there is people calling for Evita Zubats. We haven't seen him yet this season. He's been relegated to the bench. Oh, my God. And the only time that we've seen a backup center come in, it's been Andrew Bogut. Is it time to unleash the zoo, or, or what do we need to do here? I regret my role in building the Zubats fan army a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, uh, I've had so many people in my in my Twitter mentions asking about him. And I, I mean, he was pretty good in the preseason, but he was really bad during summer league. The Lakers have shown that they're kind of better and best when they play small. So I think I don't think that the solution is getting another traditionally sized center in there as much as everybody likes Zubats and thinks that he has like potential. I think this might end up being almost like a red shirt year for him in, in if the Lakers are trying to win games and do things like that, be unless somebody gets hurt because right now if you, if the Lakers are going to play minutes with a traditional big that should just be Lopez and then for the rest of that time they should pretty much be trying to go small except for them in the most extreme cases like if Randall is getting just obliterated by whoever the center is that night then maybe you dust off Bogut or Zubats but I think that other than the minutes where Lopez is playing the Lakers should be playing small they've just shown that they're better that way 
Yeah, they have, and especially at the pace that Luke Walton wants to play. He actually came out the other night and said that he wants to pick up the pace. He wants to play faster, and right now the Lakers are actually playing at the fourth fastest pace in the entire league. I mean, so I don't know how much more they can really push down on the turbo button. Is is that going to cure things for their for their offense, or this or is this just like hurry up the play because our offense sucks and we need to get get points in transition is that what this is about because their their half court offense right now is is dead last in the league so is that what luke is going for is just just to avoid having to actually run their run their offense until they are able to improve and actually install some sort of an offense here yeah well when you when you talk about their half court is worse than the league and they're actually like fifth i think in points per play in transition so there's a reason that luke wants more of those plays but i think the, i mean the only other reason other than that is we have to ask the question is luke walton trying to kill the lakers because they're playing so fast and running so much i, I don't know that they really can crank the pace for an entire season much more than they already are especially when you know lonzo ball has had conditioning issues at time in his career like they're all young players that are adjusting to the grind of an 82 game NBA season. And so I do wonder how long they can push it like this, but we'll see. I mean, that that's where Lonzo's best. That's where this team has shown that it's best. And so it, there's no real doubt in my mind why Luke Walton wants to play faster. They're, they're very clear, numerical, statistical, and just eye test reasons for why he wants to play faster. I'm just not sure that they can play much faster consistently than they already are right now. Right, they're already pretty much running at at warp speed, and I just don't, I don't know, I mean, they're already fourth fastest in the NBA, and they don't necessarily have all of the fastest personnel, they do have some athletes out there, but I mean, Brooke Lopez isn't going to really run the break, neither is, is Andrew Bogut, I mean, I think that at some point they're just going to have to get better in the half court offense and that'll happen over time. And like we were saying, it's also going to happen if you can make some changes here, if you can add in a shooter like Kyle Kuzma, then that makes a significant difference in that starting five. And speaking of which I'm, I'm really shocked that Luke hasn't already made that change because he was ranting and raving or praising, I should say after the game against the Phoenix suns, about how open the middle of the floor was for the Lakers because he had shooters on the floor. He didn't specifically say Kuzma by name, but Lonzo Ball was walking to the rim partially because the Suns were a terrible defensive team, but also partially because Kuzma was out there and the Suns had to stay at home on him. So you would think after seeing that, seeing the impact of playing Kuzma and Lonzo together, that he would have already made that change, but hasn't quite happened yet. So far, he's sticking with, with Larry Nance Jr., Maybe it's because Magic Johnson called him the secret weapon. I don't know. But Larry Nance Jr. does seem to be better suited for a role off the bench at this I, point. And again, that's not talking bad on Larry Nance Jr. Love what Larry Nance Jr. brings. Just want to get the best out of him. And it appears like, like coming off the bench may be that role for him. I, I think the only secret right now is why he is continuing to be in the starting lineup. Because it's not totally obvious to me. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't seem. I I I kind of get it. Although when they signed uh, Brook Lopez or traded for Brook Lopez, instantly the reaction was, "Oh, this guy is the perfect guy to play alongside Julius Randle." It wasn't that everybody said, "Oh, this is the perfect opportunity for Larry Nance Jr. to hop into the starting five. It was that he's going to make up for a lot of what Julius Randle does. That was the main discussion. And then it was, well, maybe this is a good fit with, with Kuzma. So Nance being out there, it's a bit of a head scratcher. He has had some good performances, but overall, you know, he just hasn't been the, the fit that you want. And with the offense struggling the way it is, I think you got to make this change. I mean, this is a season where they need to win games, right? There's no benefit to losing at all. There is no tanking this season because the Lakers don't have their draft pick next summer, their first round pick. So at this point, you need to do whatever it takes to win games and show free agents above all else that you're a team that is prepared to make a leap that, hey, you want LeBron James to look at this team and think, man, they're tough. They're not that bad. If you add me to the team, then how high does that take us? Right. You want to be kind of that one or two pieces away. And that's the type of thing that you can sell to free agents. Now, anyway, Harrison, let's let's look ahead very briefly to next week. This coming week, the Lakers on Halloween, they take on the Detroit Pistons. 
So they've got that matchup coming up. Then on Thursday, the second, they have the Portland Trailblazers. And then the very next night, they get their reunion game against D'Angelo Russell. They'll be taking on the Brooklyn Nets. So the next three games are pretty big for the Lakers. Any projections or predictions on on how they're going to do here? I think they go two and one. I think there's actually a chance to go three and zero. Oh. I, I think these are all like very winnable games for to me. I, I don't. I don't. I, I'm not really like in love with the Pistons at all. The Blazers are obviously a good team, but the Lakers seem to always like play them fairly close until Damian Lillard explodes. So maybe right. like maybe this game he just like doesn't explode. I don't know. But and then they're obviously going to be very very motivated to win that game against the Nets and D'Angelo Russell and show that. You know, they, they made the right choice in choosing Lonzo. I mean, obviously the team didn't choose to trade D'Angelo Russell to the Nets, but I, I think they're, Lonzo's their guy now, and he's their leader, and I think that there's going to be a lot of riding on this game, especially as well as Russell plays, that if he has been playing, that if he comes in and lights up Lonzo Ball, then people are going to start kind of crapping on Ball, I think a lot more openly in L.A., especially in the media, and so like so like and start picking apart that trade retroactively and so i think they're going to be pretty motivated to kind of stand up for their guy uh, and make sure that they come out on the winning end of that one yeah you know that's going to happen uh russell's going to come out firing and the lakers are playing that game on the second night of a back-to-back they have portland the night before portland is always tough in portland that's where the lakers are going to be playing that one so it's on the road i think that one's going to be a a difficult one to pick up the win i given what's happened these last few games I think they they win against Detroit. I've got a probably a loss against the Blazers, and then I see the game against the Nets as being extremely close. I think the Nets have been a lot better this season than anybody expected, but I'm going to go ahead and be optimistic, and I'm going to say the Lakers get a win against Brooklyn, which uh, which would be great to see. So that about wraps things up. Harrison, any any parting comments or anything like that before we get out of here? Uh, I mean, I, I just I would sell I would selfishly say listen to Locked On Lakers and uh, let you know follow uh, like Trevor and I's work at Lakers Nation. But I think other than that, I don't I think we touched on pretty much all my thoughts on the team lately. I just I really think that there is reason for concern right now because once this defense starts to drop off, I, I don't know if, if their offense is going to make enough of a corresponding jump for them to continue to win games even at the rate they're currently doing, which is already people are mad about. Right. And I think that everybody out there in, in Lakers land and myself personally can all say, well, Harrison, we, we hope you're wrong on this one. And Most I'm people sure do. Hope you're Most wrong people too. do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there, there is reason for concern and hopefully, hopefully they'll be able to pull it together and things will start looking better. Uh, Brandon Ingram has shown some flashes. One guy that we didn't touch upon today, but uh, he's a guy that I'm definitely going to be looking at over this next week to see kind of how he handles things as we get further into the season so harrison thank you so much for for coming on the show today man appreciate it no thank you for having me trevor it's always a blast catching up with you and talking lakers so that was harrison fagan you can find him on twitter at hm fagan always a great follow and of course a great guy to have on the show so we certainly appreciate him coming on that's going to about wrap things up for us today don't forget guys go to myundies.com slash lakers nation get 20 percent off that's such a great deal and of course uh, naturebox.com slash lakers for 50 percent off your first order of some phenomenal snacks some great deals there to go check out my name is trevor lane you can find me on twitter at trevor underscore lane and of course you can find this show on itunes tune in stitcher the clns media app and of course lakersnation.com make sure you guys go subscribe rate and review this show on itunes thanks everybody for listening we'll be back soon with another show see ya